um, in putting together this lecture for this year, we've had a couple of people and associations helping us to make sure that this lecture takes place, uh, even though it's taking place virtually uh, all over the world and in South Africa. We would like to forward our thanks and gratitude to Putanang Youth Trust, Dalro, a dramatic artist and literary rights organization, Mrs. Lerato Mohaki, uh, Dependable Strengths and Risimati Consulting Engineers, uh, Mr. Dimape Serignane, and um, Ndate F. Mudise. And also thanking um, the Morris Isaacson Center for Music, who have generously housed this lecture for today. The children or the young people that you heard who were playing music outside as you were walking in are part and parcel of this music center uh, that we are in today. Our next speaker is uh, a representative from uh, Putanang Youth Trust, uh, Patricia Moletzane. Can we give her a round of applause, please? Guest, Professor Blisana and Professor Mohali, members of the Maurice Isaacson alumni, the Machine and the Family, Maurice Isaacson High School teachers, learners, and the principal, ladies and gentlemen, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, viewers at home in all supporting channels, Dumelang. My name is Patricia Mletzani and I will be representing Putanang Youth Trust a youth trust organization established locally in Jabavu by individuals who saw it fit to build a vehicle that will empower, uplift, and inspire the youth in the community of Jabavu through programs and initiatives that will address socioeconomic challenges needed around the community. The aim and the visions are to achieve a working community, especially the youth, through education, sports, establishment, establishing and supporting SMMEs, as well as other community upliftment pro programs. The inspiration was drawn from the youth of 1976, who, despite the challenges, were able to be the driving force tackling challenges that were affecting them during that time. To this day, the flaming torch is still burning, as Putanang we take it upon ourselves to carry this future generations, AMA 2000, and generations thereafter by partnering with different organizations and businesses to equip youth with the necessary skills, education, that will assist them in rooting out poverty around the community and in their respective homes. Putanang, being established by local individuals, believes in the spirit of plowing back to the community schools and local businesses. Since the beginning of the machine in the lecture, Putanang has been a strategic supporter as we saw a good initiative that will keep the memory and the name of TNT Machinine alive. We are also anticipating a working relationship whereby the Morris Isaacson alumni will avail some of his skills and working personnel to other initiatives that will Putanang will be embarking on. This is a start of a new normal. Putanang, I thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for the presentation. And also, I would like to acknowledge the family of Maurice Isaacson, alumni, dating back to the 70s up until today. Some of them are here with us, 
and others are watching from the different social media streams. Um, if it wasn't for them, uh, we wouldn't have these annual lectures. And we would like to thank you, wherever you are watching today, to say thank you very much for allowing us and giving us this privilege and chance to can continuously hold these lectures on an annual basis and also to the Machinini family to say thank you very much to you also for partnering with the Morris Isaacson alumni in this venture that we do on a yearly basis. Uh, thank you very much. Now on a lighter note, I would like to, we have a young lady who's gonna give us some poetry. Uh, her name is Komoto Matebe, and her stage name is Morare and Zulu. Give them a round of applause, please. Morare. and I hope you guys enjoy what we have prepared for you. I'm 
Muslim ke khopela hore tswarele hle hore tswarele sna tlasele godimo with the new way of life a woman and children suffered they would be lying in a pool of blood pregnant and hanging on a tree World War Three is that you? I know you came to this. No, wait. Whoa, 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 whoa. You wait right there. See, like everything that comes to an end, you are no more. And I can run a now. Get a not with my children, not with my father, not with my brother, and not with that woman. And today I want to tell her that she is limitless. Give us one year, I'm 31. She is sensational and she can do everything and anything that she puts her mind to. Do not let them lie to you, Mama. Do not let them lie to you, Mama. See, Musadi Uyimba Goto. Musadi, you are power. You are power. Musadi, you are power. Musadi Uyimba Goto. Musadi Umata. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much to Homozo for that wonderful rendition. January 2020, as we were still celebrating the new year, after we had crossed over from 2019 to 2020, we woke up uh, with headaches and excitement that we are going into 2020 and we've made our plans for the year. Little did we know that our lives before the end of the first quarter of the year, that our lives will be thrown into a deep tunnel. Little did we know that the country and the world will be made to make a U-turn from the plans that the world and the country had made. We didn't know what was going on then. And some of us even now still don't know what is going on because some of us still talk about the myths and the truths about the COVID pandemic. Some of us still spread false information about this pandemic because we don't know, or maybe we choose not to know what is going on. And today, as we continue in this lecture, to teach and to inform people in our country and around the world about COVID-19. 
And now the good thing about COVID-19 in South Africa is that it gave rise to what is now commonly known as family meetings. We never had family meetings. And today, the Morris Jackson alumni, together with its partners, we have embarked on this family meeting to continue to inform the country and the world about the pandemic, where we've been, where we are, and where we should be in the future. And I'm somewhat to take us through that process, we have Professor Kolegam Lisana, who is the Executive Manager of Academic Affairs, Research and Quality Assurance at the National Health Laboratory Services since July 28. Prior to this, she was the HOD of Medical Microbiology at UKZN uh, ILH, also served a term as a member of uh, the National Health Laboratory Services. And up until recently, he was a member of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on Antimicrobial -microbi Resistance. She has previously been an active HIV AIDS researcher for over a decade, focusing on HIV prevention and pathogenesis, working at the Center of, for the HIV Program of Research in South Africa, in Durban. She has un undertaken seminal research which has revealed how the body responds during acute HIV infection. Her current research interests include TB diagnostics, antimicrobial resistance, as well as sexual transmitted infections. Amongst other national commitments, Professor Mlisana is the current co-chair of the COVID-19 Ministerial Advisory Committee. She recently chaired the Pathology Laboratory Subcommittee of the first established MEC for COVID-19. She's a member of the Board of Trustees for the South African National AIDS Council, as well as the Medical and Dental Board of HPCSA. She has natured and mentored many young scientists and is passionate about equipping the next generation of leaders and scientists. Kindly welcome, assist me to welcome Professor Kolega Mlisana, who will take us through a process of slides and information into the COVID pandemic. Let's kindly give you a round of applause, please. Good afternoon, everybody. I really would like to just take this opportunity and uh, thank all the organizers of this uh, great session and uh, the Machinini family, the Morris Isaacson High School uh, leadership, and also to just greet everybody who is online from the various modalities. <coughs> As already mentioned, my name is Kolega Mlisana, and for me, this is truly a great honor and a pleasure that I could come today and deliver this lecture, the Tietz Machine Memorial Lecture. You know, as I was pondering about this, what dawned on me is that actually, Tietz Machine would have been 65 years on the 27th of January next year. And why I remember this is I suddenly realized that he actually was just born a day after my husband was born. Because my husband was born on the 26th of January the same year. Now, CAT has been acclaimed as one who made an indelible mark in shaping the history of our country. He is hailed 
as a fearless fighter and a student leader whose name will forever be etched in memory as one of the outstanding leaders of the South African Revolution. And my question is, what revolution was this? This was a revolution against the use of Africans as the medium of instruction in schools. And I remember this day vividly because I was a, a scholar that time as well. This revolution was a revolution against the oppressive Bantu education that we were going through at that time. It was a revolution for a better education. And as a result, we all became beneficiaries of that revolution. The young people, the generation after this big day has actually benefited from that revolution. And my task today, I thought I want to actually revolve around education. And I took time to find out what is the definition of, of education. And I liked, amongst other definitions, I liked what Wikipedia defines as education. It's actually defined as the process of facilitating learning or the acquisition of knowledge, skills, values, morals, beliefs, and habits. And it is said that when we look and define education in our minds today, we seem to only concentrate on the first two attributes, attributes, which are acquisition of knowledge and acquisition of skills. How many of us take education as actually an opportunity to acquire values, to acquire morals, to acquire beliefs, and to acquire habits, and I would dare say good habits? I see values, morals, beliefs, and good habits as constructs of character. When we say, here is a woman or a man of character, someone who has got integrity, from this definition, we are still talking somebody who is educated. It is unfortunate that we seem to have dropped these components of education and only are addressing the first two. And for me, I think that's going to be a discussion and a lecture for another day, because we need to go back to that. So my focus today is on the aspect of imparting knowledge whilst highlighting the importance of acquiring knowledge. A famous book that I strongly believe in that has built who I am says, people perish because they lack knowledge. Young people, lives were lost fighting for a better education system for you and our grandchildren and generations to come. Tsietsi Mashinini left the comfort of his home and his home and family. So the challenge to you from me today is get knowledge, get understanding, get wisdom. What is it that we know about the, the pandemic? What is it that we know about COVID pandemic? How many of us actually have taken the time to gain the knowledge and a better understanding from reliable sources? Because it's important where you're getting your knowledge from. Who feeds into your mind? And when we look at this, are we honestly relying on WhatsApp forwarded messages and Facebook to educate us about a disease that has brought the whole world to a standstill? And I say the fact that you have got access to Facebook, it actually means you can get online and you can get information and you can educate yourself about these things. How many of us have taken the time to search Google 
about the pandemic and identify reliable websites where we can get the information. You know, there is this very sad saying that says, if you want to hide anything from a black man or a black woman, write it down. It is very sad and personally, I strongly believe that it is not true. I believe it is absolutely false and in fact is outward, outright degrading. But the question I want to leave with you, do you as an individual agree with me? That as an individual I will use whatever I have collected from school and I will make sure that I educate myself, I will read, I will take the time to get into reading habits. So, let me try and quickly take you through the COVID pandemic and I'm going to be specifically exploring the vaccine development in the hope of clarifying some of the myths and false theories that continue to be rampant on the social media. And that is why I have titled, entitled my topic today as COVID pandemic and the vaccine update. <clears throat> if this does move. Okay, thank you. So I will go through actually the pandemics and then I will go through the global and the local COVID pandemic, the history of the vaccines. There were a lot few, a few other things and then I will take us through as to where are we now in so far as vaccines are concerned and what really needs to be done. Now what this slide is showing, it's just taking us through the different pandemics that we have seen in history. And I'm not sure how much of this you can see, but really we have seen a lot of pandemics throughout the world. They have come and gone. And way back as, you know, in the early 165, that was, you know, the, the Antonian plague. We have gone through the smallpox, and most of us would have known and would know smallpox. And we even saw the HIV pandemic epidemic coming through our country and we have lived through that. The, really the message I want to bring is that pandemics have happened before, they have come and gone, they have been seasonal. So this is nothing new. So often these pandemics are unpredictable. We never know what actually stimulates, what causes an epi a pandemic to come up. And most of the times there are no specific seasons. We cannot really predict. But there will be variations in the different pandemics depending on whether, you know, how many people are likely to, be, to, to, to die, what we call, you know, the case fatality rates of those that are infected, how many will die. And we have seen, we've lived through this, you know, throughout, you know, um, the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic. And also the severity of disease, severity of the illness, and the patterns of the illness. So these often vary, you know, um, depending on the pandemic. Sometimes we see it as a rapid surge. That's how they often start. They are as a rapid surge of cases over a brief period of time. And before we know it, we realize that actually it has gone through the world and they spread across. And they tend to occur in waves. And we have seen this with, uh, with uh, COVID-19. Now, what actually happened with co-virus uh, 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 2? What happened there? We all know that the first case was actually identified in China, Wuhan. And when this happened, within no time, they had seen a number of cases with similar illnesses. And before they knew it, really this had spread across the city and we then started to see the, 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 the same cases getting out of China and you find that what we have seen as positive when we talk about how global everybody has become transportation is the transportation has actually been the same vehicle that has been used to spread most of these pandemics because within very few months it was actually spreading across the globe 
So this takes us until about uh, January 2020. And what I really just want to stress here is how much had already happened within that short space of time. And I will highlight this to you just now. Now, if we're looking at the pandemic then over the year, if we can start when WHO declared COVID-19 as a pandemic, which was in Ma 11th of March, 2020. Then by April the 2nd, there were confirmed cases of COVID-19 up to about more than a million worldwide. And this was only a matter of just a month. And if you count back to December, that would have been about four months. And then by, you know, by September 28th, there was already global deaths of more than a million. By the time we got to March 11 of this year, which was 12 months after the declaration by WHO, the pandemic had continued with millions of confirmed cases and 2.6 million deaths, even though there were recoveries, because in any pandemic, you will get the mortalities, but you also will get those that will actually survive. So we found ourselves within a year having really contested through this and a lot had happened that actually had changed our lives in so many different ways. Very briefly where we are right now, this is as far back as two days ago, and you can see that right now we have got more than 174 million cases across the world. And of these, three, more than 3.7 million cases have succumbed to the disease. And they are actually, the disease is actually all over the country. And I was just looking to see where do we fit as Africa. We are sitting on country number five in the numbers. And we know that the Americas have got the highest numbers. Closer home. This is where we are as South Africans. This is what we have lived through. We have seen when the first case was identified in the country, which was in March 20, 20, 2020. And immediately after that, we experienced what we had never experienced before, a lockdown. And everybody was shut down you know, into their homes. A lot of issues came up, social behavioral, because we were just not used to being locked down together as families. We went through the first wave, we lost a lot of families, we lost a lot of friends, we lost a lot of colleagues, a lot of healthcare workers were lost to the, to the first wave. There was a lull, it seemed like, you know, everything was, might just be fine. But what I always want to say is that the good thing is when we had the lockdown much earlier, at least as a country, it allowed us in the healthcare sector to prepare for the coming first wave. When the second wave hit us just around December of last year, little did we expect that we were actually not just going to be hit by the same virus that had actually reached our shores in March, but the virus, because it is in the nature of viruses to multiply and mutate as they multiply. The virus had actually mutated and we found ourselves during the second wave being hit by a new variant, which as researchers, we didn't have clear understanding, we didn't know its characteristics, so it brought in, whilst we were still trying to understand the pandemic, it brought in a new dimension of a variant, and by that time, there were a few other variants that were being identified across the world. As a result, we saw a much higher number of infections because we were able to determine that this variant that has surfaced within our country was actually resulting in higher rates of transmission. Lo and behold, we were able to bring the infections down and we really have just come out of that phase. And it really would be a miss of me not to take this time and emphasize to every South African that just yesterday we were declared to actually getting onto the third wave. And we need to take cognizance of that because it is really, I believe, truly in our hands 
to control that, how much the third wave, what damage is going to do. What I'm showing here is a slide where the two waves and now the third have been superimposed over each other. Just so you can appreciate that the level of the first wave was lower than the second wave. What that means is the number of people who were infected were lower, at the peak were lower compared to the second wave. We had a lot more infections during the second wave. And now the question that I want to pose to each and every one of us, how is the shape of the graph of the third wave going to look like? As you can see, it has started to actually creep up very steeply. We saw in Gauteng specifically over the last two, three days where we have been getting more than the first day, actually where we had these high numbers, we had more than 5,000 cases in 24 hours. And we continue at this trajectory because yesterday we had across the, 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 the nation, we had not more than 9,000 cases in just one day across the, you know, across the country. And I think Gauteng was sitting at just below 5,000. So really we need to be careful and make sure that we can control this. Now, it is not just the number of cases that is increasing, but we know that firstly you see the number of infections, number of cases in increasing and the second thing we're going to see is that our hospitals are going to be you know uh, overwhelmed and that's where you and I need to actually make sure we do the best that we can and following that then we will see the number of deaths which is depicted in the red line on this particular slide now I've talked about um, these pandemics talk about a uh, smallpox most of the young people, they don't know what smallpox is because smallpox has been eradicated. What this says to us is that pandemics come and pandemics go. We are able to, you know, to actually eradicate some of these infections, infectious diseases. And how did we achieve this? Smallpox specifically, the day we were able to actually discover a vaccine against smallpox, that was the time that we started towards smallpox eradication. So to eradicate, we have used vaccines to eradicate pandemics. Not just smallpox alone, everybody knows that in the country we do childhood immunization and I say this all the time, you ask any mother, every mother knows you, you get your child today, he or she gets a jab in hospital before she is discharged, six weeks without fail you go back to the clinic to get immunization and that's a standard, that's who we are as South Africans because we saw the value of vaccinations, we saw the value of immunization and as a result because of availability of these immunizations we have actually managed to control and reduce a lot of mortalities that would have been as a result of these infections and we have seen this in a variety of, infec of infections in children we talk about diphtheria we talk about pertussis we talk about tetanus all those infections are now not seen as commonly as they used to be because of vaccinations what is the history of vaccines then? If you're looking at this slide, you can see that there have been various vaccines that have been developed over the time. And there have been vaccines against typhoid fever, polio, I've already mentioned uh, chicken, I mean smallpox, against measles, mumps and rubella. And if you look at this particular slide, you can see the time it takes from the time you have, you, 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 you develop the vaccine, test it in human trials, to the time that you can see it is effective and you then roll it out to the uh, community. And what I really just want to highlight, because I know that's everybody's concern because if you're looking at the bottom, I included from this slide, which was gracious, graciously you know, uh, given to me, there's also HIV there. We have had HIV for quite a while, but as of today, we still do not have a vaccine against HIV. But what have we really achieved? There's a lot that has been achieved in so far as controlling the HIV epidemic. Right now, everybody knows that HIV is a chronic illness like any other chronic illness. If you take your antiretroviral therapy, you are able to manage the disease. But unfortunately, we have not managed to identify a vaccine that can be used. But 
but as far as COVID-19 is concerned, we have been able to utilize the knowledge that has been built over the years, especially in trying to get an HIV vaccine, and we have used that knowledge to actually fast track getting to a, 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 a COVID-19 vaccine. What this slide is showing you is what we do, you know, when we, uh, uh, we are developing vaccines. Somebody comes up with a, a product that they feel it should work and it actually would stimulate an immune response. We test it on animals first and if it is safe on animals and it works and does what we think it should do, it then moves on to human trials. And for human trials we have got three phases. Phase one is always about safety, a few individuals who are well to ensure that whatever product we are testing, it works and you know, it, is, it is safe. Then we move on to second phase uh, trials and then we move on to phase three. Now if you're looking at this graph, you can see that generally when we're developing vaccines, it can take anything really from about 10 up to 30 years. I mean here we are with HIV, we still haven't got a vaccine. But as far as COVID-19 is concerned, within 12 months there was a product that could actually be, be used. And for us, we really look at this as a success story because we're able to build on the knowledge that was there before and it allowed us to fast track into getting an, a, a vaccine. <coughs> So we're able to get a vaccine within a year. And what really, one of the biggest um, uh, uh, successes that allowed for this is that when Chinese had the first c c case of, of uh, COVID-19, within a few weeks, in fact, maybe a week or, or two, they were able to do a genomic analysis, a full genome analysis of the virus. And now in science, once you have analyzed the full genome, it becomes a lot easier to develop whether it's going to be treatments, it's going to be vaccines, or whatever modalities that you might need because you know exactly what constitutes that particular infective or, 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 or agent. And so this was one great breakthrough. That's why we're able, within no time, I think by May, there were already products that were ready to go, having gone through the animal studies, to go into human trials. What I always want to stress is, even though we it took just 12 months to get a, a vaccine. There is not a single step of safety, a single step of ensuring that it is done accordingly and every other step when it comes to protecting humans was taken. So there were no shortcuts whatsoever. The advantage we had is that a lot of platforms were already available. And because COVID, I mean, uh, 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 um, if you're looking at uh, COVID-19, it's a short a term illness. You know, you get exposed today, you will show symptoms within three, four days, and we say stay at home, quarantine if you have, have been contact, or isolate if you are infected. And after 10, 14 days, you are fine, because then you would have been clear. So that is the other advantage that we had, in that we're able to establish these clinical trials and be able to learn from them within very, a very short space of time. Very briefly then, what are vaccines? And when we are actually talking about vaccine development, what are we trying to do? What happens is that when you have an infectious agent, it gets into your body. Now we know viruses cannot multiply outside of cells. So they need to get into a human cell, and once it gets into the human cell, the virus then takes charge of the human machinery and replicates itself. And once it replicates itself within the cell, it then gets expressed outside the cell as multiple viruses that have just been formed. And what would then happen, you know, in these bodies of ours, is that when the body recognizes those new viruses coming out, it then stimulates the body to recognize that there is something foreign. As a result, what we call the immune response is stimulated. And what the immune response does is that it actually builds up what we would term in HIV, amasocia, soldiers of the body. It builds antibodies, it builds, you know, a whole lot of other, you know, uh, 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 organelles that would then protect us. As a result, 
when that uh, you get exposed to the same infection, then there are already these antibodies that have been developed. That's what happens in a normal body. With vaccines, what we then try and do, we aim to expose the body to a similar product, if it is a protein, which is not harmful to the body, but when it gets into the body, it's going to cause the cell to produce the same immune response so that when you get exposed to the virus later on, your body has already got this uh, immune response. So that basically is what vaccination is all about, to stimulate, cheat the body into stimulating protection so that when you are faced with the enemy, protection is already there. And there are various forms of, vi of viruses. You know, I really think what I want to just stress, and we have seen this throughout you know, um, uh, uh, medicine, how to make viruses and how they work but the ones that I know people are often worried about are the ones we call nucleic based acid based vaccines basically what these are and the example in COVID-19 is the Pfizer vaccine which is currently being used in the country and another example is the Moderna vaccine what these vaccines are they are actually what we call those of you who have done you know a biology will know what mess messenger RNA is during protein synthesis. So what messenger RNA is, it is an instruction, it's a piece of instruction that when injected into your body, it tells your cell, you know what, make this protein. And then that protein is a protein that is similar to the virus protein. And then your cell will express that protein and as a result, the body will think it is an infection. And immune response so that after vaccination when you get exposed to, co to, to SARS cov virus 2 you then already have got protection because you've got antibodies so that's basically what it is people have asked does this not alter your DNA and my strong uh, answer is no it does not because it is a messenger RNA it does not even get into the nucleus where the DNA is and also RNA everybody knows who works in, in, in biology that RNA is actually very easy to destroy and within a few hours once it has done what it was intended to do it gets destroyed so we should not worry about that and I've already mentioned all of this about the messenger RNA viruses. And as I've already said, we have tapped into the technologies that were there for HIV vaccine for, you know, to develop uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. And these are the different platforms that we use. And it just shows you the examples of some of the vaccines that we know of and are familiar with. Where are we sitting? As we speak right now, we have got actually a lot, there's a huge pipeline of, vi of, va of vaccines vaccines that is coming, which is great for the globe, because every other country is really looking for a vaccine. And so it's good that there are lots of uh, different vaccines that are in the pipeline. And right now we have got eight that have been approved. And that's why it seems like there's a struggle for every country, for every nation, for every continent to actually access these vaccines. And the one I've already talked uh, briefly about, the Pfizer one, which we're using in the country, we also have seen during the Sisonga trial where we're using the J&J vaccine and that's the one we're all eagerly waiting that it can be released once the FDA has said it is fine and I know that beyond that then we'll expect our regulatory authority, the SAPRA, to look through it and then give us the, the go ahead if we can go ahead or not. We, will, we are awaiting you know, a report from them and once that is done then we'll have these lots of vaccines being released from Kabeha. So this one is a single shot and that's the advantage and it is easy to store which is why government had planned that it would be used for the hard to reach areas of our country and we really are hoping that we will get this as soon as possible. What this slide is showing you just so that everybody understands as we stand we have got more than 2.2 billion individuals who have received vaccines.
And I'm stressing this because there are people who are still worried, what is this vaccine going to do to me? But I want to assure you, we've got already two, more than 2.2 billion individuals across the world who have had doses. Because remember, some vaccines are two doses, others are just one dose. Those that have been fully vaccinated are sitting at 480 million across the globe. So we really are waiting and hoping that as a country, we will quickly get to that level where because we're aiming to have at least 60, 67 to 70 percent of the population in the country vaccinated because when we reach those levels, then we'll be able to reach what we call herd immunity. So people are often worried about safety, what's going to happen after I have received the vaccine. The, the same regulatory body that monitors every product that comes into the country continues to monitor everybody after vaccination. And the call that we're making to the citizens of this country is that when you go for vaccination, should you have any symptoms, should you feel any symptoms in your body, you need to report this. Because remember, yes, these are new vaccines and therefore we want to make sure as scientists that we collect as much information so that we are able to see and fully understand what actually happens so we can be able to alert should there be any you know, issues that are coming up. So it's important for citizens of the country to ensure that they actually will report any adverse effects that they have. This just shows where we are as a country. And I thought I would put this one up so I can take people through. I mentioned earlier on that please use Google and you will find this data. The, the, the country has got this page which is SA coronavirus and that's where you'll find all the numbers that we talk about at any point in time. And what this the map does, it actually gives a very good summary in that you can see how many people have been tested, how many cases have we had as a country, how many how many recoveries have we had as a country and how many deaths have we had and then we're able to pick up the new cases each day. So when I'm talking about we had 9,000 the other day, this was yesterday I think, the total yesterday was 8,000 and I have not seen today's uh, figures where we're sitting. So we can see that and then it tells you how many active cases, it gives you the date and the good thing here is that we also, this has also included how many people are vaccinated and I want to stress this because as you know the Department of Health continues to inform us how many vaccines are coming into the country we also as citizens of the country want to hold the, you know, the department responsible by checking to see the numbers of vaccines that are coming into the country are we able to give those vaccines to people so you can use the number of vaccines to check to see how many vaccinations were done each day at home they know when I look at this I always say to them bring the calculator let's look how far we, how far are we today and you minus where we were yesterday so we can see how many numbers are we reaching each day and we are not forgetting that we have been promised that we want to actually build and ramp up to a level where we are vaccinating 250,000 in individual South Africans a day right now I think we're sitting anywhere between 90 and 95,000 which is actually well I mean we could do a lot better so we really want to see a lot of ramping up so that we can get to those numbers to ensure that we reach the numbers that are targeted within the specified time. So, you know what to do. Sanitize. Right now, as South Africans, we're on the third wave. And like I said, it's up to us. If you make sure that you wash your hands, if you make sure that you do not... Uh, get into big crowds. You make sure that you actually social distance. And I always say you use a mask and please, there is a way of using a mask properly. When we're talking put on the mask, we mean cover the nose and the mouth. You see a lot of people walking around with their masks right here. That is not masking. Masking is you cover your nose, you pinch if the one is the one you can pinch so that it closes the whole area and that is proper masking. And this is my last slide and I want to say to you 
let's remember that vaccines may be there, but vaccines do not save lives. It is getting vaccinated that saves lives. Government can get whatever doses that the country requires of vaccines, but if we don't actually register for vaccination, we will not then be protected. So either make sure that you are registered through the EVDS, that every, almost every day they take us through how to do that. And let's also use this opportunity, especially for young people. We all have got these phones. Help the elderly to register and make sure that you can make a contribution. All said and done, we are now 35 years post June 16, 1986. What is it that we have achieved really? And how have we upheld the revolution against that oppressive education? Are we acquiring knowledge that informs our decision-making process? Right now, I've just taken you through the epidemic. I've taken you through what vaccine, vaccine, how vaccines de are developed. I've taken you through where vaccination is. What are you going to do with that information? How is what I have told you today going to change your decision and make sure that you make an informed decision and you come and get vaccinated? Are we acquiring the necessary skills to be able to survive? And where are we as a nation in so far as, I want to come back to this, in so far as values, in so far as morals, beliefs, and habits are concerned. I honestly and sincerely want to challenge each and every South African today that let's embrace the full definition of the word education. Right now, as a country, we are desperately looking for men and women of integrity, men and women of good character, people that we can rely on to take us through the next generation. And more than just the next generation, we want those men and women to right now arise and take us out of this deep quagmire we're finding ourselves in as a country, in every aspect. Not just for yourself, not just for your children, but for your grandchildren and the next and generations to come. Thank you very much. Can we give her another round of applause, please? <laughs> Professor Mlisana, thank you very much. After that presentation, education that we've just received, uh, I wouldn't know what else would we require to do. Kasutubari, and my grandmother also used to say this, if we are not going to take a leaf from what has been presented to us today, own it, make it ours, and venture forward, not into the world, but into our own families and societies, because that's where we need to start if we have to fight this pandemic. Remember, this pandemic doesn't spread itself, but people spread it. So we need to take it, what we've been given now, own it, and work through it in order for our families, our societies to survive, and for our kids to survive. Next on our program, Renalenta de Moloto, Philip Moloto, a poet, meaning how it's a lot of it's a boy or no meaty. So that the motto is coming with a poem, uh, hotel, so what we've just been given, uh, give Professor Mlisana a round of applause.
是一样的。Thank you very much. COVID-19 did not only affect the elderly or the rich and famous. COVID-19 also affected our young pupils, affected our youth in the country and in the entire, entire world. Zandile Maumela is one of those young students from Morris Isaacson, a grade 12 lady who herself has been affected in some way or the other. Zandile is the president of the RCL, the Representative Council of Learners here at Morris Isaacson. And, um, She's going to speak to us on the effects of COVID-19 as a young person in the school and in South Africa. Uh, can you give a round of applause as she comes to the podium? Zandile Maumela, the president of Morris Isaacson High School. The COVID-19 pandemic has to be one of the most unprecedented yet greatest tests to humanity. It has time and time again made us appreciate the value of good health. To protect us from COVID-19, precautionary measures and restrictions were imposed, such as the lockdown, restricting travel, business operation, and education. This 
restrictions may have protected us from COVID-19, but they surely have not protected our basic human rights. Nor the negative effects of locating life during a global pandemic. Education has always been said to be the key to success. The key which can liberate one from the daily atrocities of poverty. Finally enough, the key was lost during a global pandemic at a time when it was needed the most. As all schools were closed, it meant that online learning was the new and safe and effective way of learning, which has no proven risk of spreading the virus. Sadly, a necessity not provided in government schools. For five months, I could not go to school. And believe me, it was very frustrating. Day in, day out, COVID cases and deaths rose with my uncertainty. The future had suddenly become inevitable, wondering if you will ever go to school again, if life will ever be the same again. And finally, wondering how many more waves until we see the last of the destruction and deaths caused by COVID-19. I hope we never ever forget how this pandemic has highlighted the fact that South Africa is one of the most unequal countries in the world. With an alarming gap between the rich and the poor. The rich and the poor who lived polar opposite lives. Whilst the rich spent the harsh, cold winter in warm, proper homes, whose children knew the luxury of just being a screen away from their education, the poor were unable to provide for themselves, barred from providing for themselves and their children, not knowing when their next meal would be. Despite the challenges we faced, we as a country somehow made it through 2020. We all had to adapt to a new normal of wearing face masks, keeping our hands clean, social distancing, and staying at home. We returned to life as per usual, despite the anxiety of being infected with the virus or potentially spreading the virus to our loved ones at home. A study by John Hopkins University says that life will never ever be the same. We will be the first generation in the 21st century that will know how it feels like to locate life during a global pandemic. This predicament has alerted us how urgently we need to change our systems of redressing human rights as a country. I have hope and faith that as I stand here before you in this historical monument, that the brutal deaths of the youth of 1976, who were brutally murdered exactly 45 years ago, that their deaths were not in vain, and that their lives matter. May they rest at ease knowing that they have inspired a new generation like me that is prepared to mask up, rise up, sanitize, and honor the legacy of the 1976 June 16 uprisings. Thank you.
another round of applause, please. Thank you, Zandile, for that uh, wonderful, wonderful speech. COVID-19 did not only affect us medically or affect the education system, but it also affected our economy. And here to speak to us about the effects of COVID-19 to our economy, our businesses, where our business was prior COVID and where it is now and where it needs to be or what we need to do to bring it up to speed. We have Professor Bonang Mohale. And now who is Professor Bonang Mohale? He is the Chancellor of the University of the Free State, Professor of Practice in the Johannesburg Business School, College of Business and Economics and Chairman of both the Bidvest Group, uh, Bidvest Group Limited and SBV Services. He is highly respected South African businessman who is known as much for his patriotism and his active role in seeking to advance the country's interests. He is the past president of BMF and author of the best-selling book, Lift As You Rise, launched in November 2018. A compilation of some of his spoken and written words in which Muhalla reveals the issues he is passionate about, among them leadership, transformation, social justice, people development, construct, constructive collaboration, and integrity. Bonam Mohale was the Chief Executive Officer of Business Leadership South Africa till June 2019, a forum which brings together the leadership of South Africa's most successful and influential big business and multinational investors to exchange ideas, facilitate effective dialogue with government and other stakeholders and advocate for pro-business economical sustainable policies and programs. Prior to joining BLSA, Mr. Muhale ended a distinguished term as Vice President Upstream and Chairman of Shell South Africa PTY LTD at the end of June 2017. Mr. Muhale has an impressive track record of building successful companies, delivering results, making significant advances in transformation in the companies he has been privileged to lead. He has been a vocal, courageous, and active proponent of transformation since 1980, and has played leadership roles in the Black Management Forum for over 33 years, where he was president. Recognition awards, he was awarded the Free Market Foundation Luminar Award for 2019 in the recognition of the outstanding courage and integrity he has displayed through difficult times in his contributions to the business community and for defending the rights of all South Africans. Winner of the Forbes Winham Africa Male Gender Advocate Award for 2019, BMF Lifetime Achievement Award in March 2019, awarded the Momentum Friendship Blazer as a recognition for being the first RSA nation building champion in 2015. Winner of both the country, that is South Africa, and SADC Regional Titans, building the nation, 2014 CEO Magazine Awards, Bonang was conferred with an honorary prof professorship in marketing management by the University of Pretoria, where he serves as the advisory council since 1992. In 2012, he was the CEO, IPM CEO of the year, South Africa Facilita Facilities Management Association 2007, personality of the year, 1997, Black Management Forums Manager of the Year, received the Presidential Award for his servanthood in South African industry and the economic empowerment of previously disadvantaged individuals in 2001. Ladies and gentlemen, 
help me to welcome Professor Bonang Mohale to the stage. Mutamaiswa <laughs> Ibile ki se klompo kuraba sotu mutlo klehi murena mohado litie wa buraru. Se klu hutlu lwa na sapete le makabani. Sa mo khachane le poko. Sa raha kadi le beula. Yena beu tsen ramuna hendi teidu. Adiri shwe shwe kale hari. Ki ma tazia tada. Palo, Limiriti is a belated city of Tuana. To Melenkiana and Elefella de la Pa, La Hamachin and Liboche, Bali Porta Potiling, Camusibiso Moto, Habano to the Machete, Ibele Meme, La Sabamoho, Siratari, Repalit, Canitrali Lebo. Allow me just to give you some f sound bites. And I'll pick it from the fifth state of the nation address by the sitting president, Tatima Tamela Sera Ramaphosa, when he distilled, synthesized the four foremost overarching priorities. When he said, all of us need to overcome this coronavirus pandemic and accelerate our economic recovery in order to implement the socio-economic reforms we've been talking about for the last 10 years to create sustainable jobs and deliver an inclusive socio-economic recovery. Lastly, he said, we needed to defeat corruption and build state capacity. So it's no accident that the very first thing that he addressed is this that is upon us and among us. Once in 100 year event, the last time at the scale and magnitude was February 1918, the Spanish flu, even though it didn't originate in Spain ended in April of 1920, 1920, 1918, 1922 years, killed 20 million people. The First World War, 17 million people, affected 500 million people. At that time, it's a third of the world's population. So the president has set us a herd immunity of 67%. That's 40 million South Africans. That's the entire adult population of 60 million South Africans. Had we started in January when he made this announcement, we should have been inoculating at the rate of 100,000 people a day, every day. Had we done that, it would have taken us 400 days or 13.3 months which means we had planned, agitated, and orchestrated to finish by the middle of 2022. So by the 27th of January, 
we had not started. So if you compare ourselves with BRIC counterparts because we're part of that economic group, Brazil had already inoculated 579,000 people. Russia, 800,000. I'm talking about vaccine doses administered. India, 2 million. China, 15 million. So the Minister of Health, Dr. Zuelin Mkise sent us, set us a target of frontline healthcare workers of 1.2 million by the end of March. So by the end of March, as a country, as a people with great natural endowments, we had inoculated 350,000 total, including the Sisonke program. And yet in our actions, we don't act like people who are already behind who need to catch up. So where are we today? Maybe as a preamble, this was going to cost us 20 billion South African rents, depending on whether it's manufactured locally or imported. On the foreign exchange, whether it's a single or double dose, cargo insurance, etc. So Stats SA confirms that only 14.3 million South Africans belong to medical aids. So the medical schemes in total have an exposure of 7 billion South African rents. But to them, the medical schemes is only 2% annual premiums. So today we're in a spot of bother, and yet the modern day Aspen Pharmaceuticals, when I grew up, was called Lennon's in Tebech, owned 100% by this government. This government owns another pharmaceutical company called Biovac since 2003. Biopharmaceutical company, and why we are now at the mercy of the rest of the world, nobody knows. So we bought 31 million Johnson & Johnson vaccines, 20 million Pfizer vaccines to cover the 40 million because it's a double dose. You see, vaccine rollout was always going to be a race because the country that can achieve herd immunity first will be able to reap the pent up tourism demand. Tourism for us pre COVID was 9.8% of the GDP. Post COVID, 7.5% and going down. So we used to have 10.2 million visitors down to less than 3 million last week at 2.8 million. There's no reason why we shouldn't be at 20% because tourism has the potential of being the greatest forex N. Where are we now? <clears throat> 11 countries have vaccinated 100% of their population. My colleague tells us that globally we are now talking at 174 million people total cases. 3.67 million deaths. In South Africa, slightly over 1.7 million total cases, approaching 57,000 deaths. But even if we compare ourselves with just our African countries. This 1.3 billion people, 55 countries, 54 of them absolute sovereign states that speak 3,000 languages, 30.3 million square kilometers of pristine coastline with a continental GDP of 3.4 trillion South African rands. Nigeria being the biggest at 414 billion US dollars, South Africa 356 billion, Egypt 315 billion. There are 29 countries that are ahead of us in terms of inoculating their population, including Gabriel Robert Mugabe Zimbabwe, who have only inoculated 1.2% of our population. 
26 countries only are behind us. And yet we are Africa's most diversified economy. Twenty-two countries have now opened their borders to people that are vaccinated without asking them to self-quarantine. And those economies will be restored, not to their previous normal or the new normal, but a better normal. Valencia in Spain, the second biggest, most visited country after France. Charles de Gaulle Airport has opened up to London Heathrow transcontinental flight. And where are we as a people with great natural endowment? Let me say that there's a role that we need to play as business. Because you see, business has a disproportionate resources. Business knows how to deliver mega projects on time, in full, on budget. SAB Miller can deliver twice a week to twice as many shibins as there are schools in, in a week. And yet our government cannot deliver once a year books to Limpopo. So Imperial has refrigerated trucks, so does the company that I'm chairman of, the Bidvest Group Limited, using their logistics to get to this. The mines when we were in lockdown level number five were open and they continue to function with people from Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Botswana, and Namibia. They know how to check their temperature and send them underground without massive infections. So if we gave them their vaccines, they'll be able to vaccinate all their people. They used to have 900,000 people, now 500,000 people. They can do it in a month. Adrian Gore of Discovery has two million members. If we gave him the vaccines and say, you worry about it, they'll be able to do it. But because we want to take the credit, we are where we are. So it will be wrong as a business not to work hand in glove with our government because only when we reach herd immunity can all of us say this thing is behind us and that this too will pass. And in fact, business did that. Business Unity South Africa, the Apex organization created Business for South Africa, seven working groups together with the BBC, the Black Business Council. In fact, it paid the first tranche of, I am rounding off figures, 250 million that was required to get us onto the COVAX program. I didn't say the 1.4 million doses that we'll get from the African Union. By the 15th of December, government said we'd have paid our second tranche, and they didn't. On the 28th of December, we're already late. Business had to pay also the second tranche. That's what patriotic business is supposed to do. So if we define our role as business, what we learn from Ivy League universities as the purpose of business being shareholder maximization will miss the mark. Because what the pandemic has taught us is that I think the primary role of business in a pandemic is to survive. Because if you can survive, you have already made profits until it comes out of your ears. And you survive by preserving cash and strengthening your balance sheet. Number two, business must deliver this notion called shared value. You see, what keeps boards awake at night is to ensure that corporate decision making is consistent not only with the whims of the shareholders, but the broader stakeholder community from which they come, the society in which they are located. Had we done that, Marika would not have happened because those senior executives drive through the informal settlement of Marika every morning and every afternoon as they come out. It should have worried them at a personal level to say our colleagues are living in informal settlements, not bricks and mortar. Therefore, we should have used every single solitary one of our resources to make sure that they also have a roof over their head because the role of business is to ensure 
ensure that we are a trusted advisor, a partner of choice, doing everything in our power to make sure that this ANC-led government becomes a capable state because we have learned through the nine wasted years that it's easier to deal with a capable state than the one that is less capable. Thirdly, I think as a business, we need to do no harm. You see, the people who are colleagues live every morning their significant relationships. And people that matter to them with two hands and ten fingers at the end of those hands. And it behooves us to do everything possible to create an environment of health, safety, security, and environment so that they can go back every afternoon absolutely complete and whole. That's the job of business. But do you know harm sounds passive? I think we need to make the world a better place. Because you see, we didn't as much inherit this world from our forebears as we borrowed it from our children. Therefore, it is our job to ensure that we live it in a state that is substantially better than we, le we found it in. That is the definition of progress, how we move forward in space and in time. But also as business, I think we need to take seriously this notion of education. Says colleague has started there. Because you see, education matters. Because through education, you can transcend social classes. Be born in Alexander in an informal settlement. 670,000 people in a six kilo, square kilometer radius. After 20 years of hard work and application, and be able to afford a house in the leafy suburbs of Princeton. Not because you want a tender, but because you end it. You deserve it and you can afford it. Just two kilometers across the bridge from the richest square mile in the continent called Sent. Education matters. Because you see, when one steadily burns the midnight oil, one gains access to the domain of knowledge and wisdom, the world of meaning, the world that cannot be conquered without a persistent crusade. So let me conclude by saying, where are we now? <laughs> the children of Holisla Nelson Mandela, the South Africa that all of us have been praying for, the South Africa of our dreams. Today, we can with certainty say the inequality is widening. Racism is at an all-time high. Black graduates are roaming the streets hopelessly. And yet we know that leaders are dealers in hope. Public health care continues to fail the poor and the vulnerable. Today, a hospital is a place you go to die, not to get health. Because health is not just the absence of disease and infirmity. It's a state a state of physical, of mental, of social, and spiritual well-being. Where we are today, twenty fifteen, these students taught us through hashtag everything must fall, precipitated by hashtag fees must fall, that they cannot be denied their only hope, which is education, only because they come from poor households. And yet every year, the academic is disrupted because they can't pay, and therefore they're excluded on the basis that their parents cannot afford. Poverty kills. Poverty, like the rolling blackouts of ESCO, like the pandemic, has primarily a black and feminine face. When you are a poor mother, you beget poor children. 
So the total historical debt to the 26 public universities is 10 billion. One and a half billion is west of KwaZulu Natal. A billion is just west, just between those two. When you include TVET colleges, it's 14 billion. We spend on average three billion a month on TVET colleges with 3% completion rate. Let me just conclude by saying business cannot continue to be an island of prosperity in a sea of poverty because when business does well, society generally does well. In the 21st century, it can be that 27 years into democracy, we are still paying women 75% of what we pay men for work of equal value, and yet we talk about gender equality and pay parity. You see, nature is a wonderful metaphor for business, because there's nothing that nature does that it does for itself. Everything that nature does, it does for others. That's why rivers don't drink their own water. Trees don't eat their own fruit. The sun doesn't shine because itself needs the vitamin D. Flowers don't give us this wonderful fragrance because they want to smell like Fontainebleau, not like Calcutta. Kya lebo ashaba kwen. Na biso laka ki bona muhali. Ki mo kwen amu koti. Ki mo khuri sonu muholo sosha kam pafat. Kwen na jarli le shaba tika mo koko. Ya se sa kwen. Ya nyulo hamadiwa. Ya <laughs> ke le rantane la ntiti ya banana ba le pume ba le lahlafatse ba re le sa le tshikisa mokwenana ha go tsheka wa tsheka mokwena o mpa sitwa kwa ga molala o tsheka jwalo ka mankukune tsie tsajwang holo ke basadi ba ntse ba mpotsa ga fetsa mokwena ha ile kae ha e suhule se ba kanyana se bole ba opala mapere le ba mauti ba ntse ba fihla o dikoti nga ba ke le bontsa nna nka gathala kwa ga molala le o dimo ja wa modiso nka ba ke romela ditlhareteng ke dilemo le mo mwana me ntse a phela very powerful words indeed there by Professor Bonang Mohale, uh, Chancellor of the University of the Free State. He's um, I think we're still on time. Now we are coming to the question and answer session. Um, I know we've been having problems with our, our social platforms, but hopefully they are back up again um, for people to send through questions and, and stuff. But uh, uh, if they are not, we'll filter those that we have. And as and when we get them, we'll filter them, we'll filter them through to to the podium. I would like to invite at this moment Dr. Richard Libeta, who will be leading this process. Your questions and answer and any comments that uh, you would like to make, you are welcome to do so. Um, can we give him a round of applause, please? Masters of Ceremonies and the House, to the professors, let me thank you for taking us through the necessary journey. 
Let me start by acknowledging the fact that the good leaders have foresight. They have a trajectory from where we are to where things are supposed to be in the near future and to navigate us through, through things, the things to be unto eternity. And that's what the both of you have just done. And this is in line what CAC and his class of 76 did. Let me thank you eternally for that. But for this moment, um, what I'm requested to do is the, to coordinate the questions um, that will come your way after taking us through this journey. I do learn that our other platforms um, have a challenge. Um, so what we will do is take questions from within um, and, 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 and see what will come um, from the other medias as coordinated by our people in there. We will take um, about five questions at a time. We would request you to have pointed questions. Um, maybe if we could start with questions and later follow with comments. Uh, we will start with questions. You will show your interest to ask a question by raising your hand and telling us who you are and who you represent and who the question is directed to. And please be short and pointed. Thank you. Let's see um, the raising of hands. Um, I have one, two, and three behind the camera. We'll start with our number one. I just want to ask our Why are we uh, not pushing in our Antonyane, Galik and Lemon to deal with each other? We have been told uh, with social distance, we have to uh, mask, uh, 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 sanitize, but we have pushed our own uh, African uh, products. We grew up using Antonyane. And it works in our immune system. And I've seen a lot of people are talking about it, it works. But you have mentioned that you are not trying to get a lot of people. Even the president, he said, I'm still great. Time we have to show you the issue, which is sanitize, social distance, and all these things. But I've given this thing. Say, I'm just pushing it over. This is if you are waiting for the right way to approve. Easy, before we start using it. How do you believe in our own product? That's the case. I want to find out about that. Thank you. Mm, thanks. Um, number two, D. Yeah. 
Thank you, Z. Um, number three. Behind the camera, and I'll recognize four and five. <laughs> Last round of these questions. Uh, good afternoon to everyone and everyone who. My question is for Professor Nisan. I'd like to find out the health department or the government stand on the Russian Sputnik drug as. South Africa being the only member of BRICS in Africa. Logic says we should be by far the most likely to vaccinated. Because Russia also offers Sputnik as a stage. But we're sitting in, 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 in the G7 in the UK. Um, China offered Zimbabwe across the road. They are vaccine and they do it better than us. What is the government's scale with this desperate situation that we have? Thank you. 
Thank you, um, uh, number five. Um, you, you'll join the next round. Maybe we should give uh, Prof. Lisana a chance to respond to these five questions, um, because most are directed to her. Thank you. Prof. Um, th thank you very much for those um, great questions. <coughs> And uh, I do want to just say up front, um, in so far as the natural products or African medicines, that is beyond my scope. And so I will not address that. But otherwise, I mean, there are lots of um, foods that we know are of value. But my focus and my area of expertise is really on medicine you know from the west because that's where my training comes from and so as to i don't even want to try and dabble in that i mean we all know the positives of some i mean like garlic everybody knows we use that in our foods but i don't want to focus on that Okay, and then, so when somebody gets vaccinated, um, it takes time for the body to develop the antibodies that I was talking about. So when we're looking at whether the vaccine is effective or not, we always look at, um, we, we've got to follow the individuals that are vaccinated. We know that the best immune responses show well now, you know, with more information that we have in so far as the different COVID vaccines. The best immunity is after 28 days of vaccination. You do see an immune response from day 14 onwards. Now what that means is that anything can happen in between. So when we get vaccinated, we want to follow people and in fact when we talk about um, there's this concept of breakthrough infections which means infections that occur in people who have been vaccinated we usually look at those after 48 i mean 28 hours uh, 28 days of vaccination because we know the data that's available shows that the majority and the highest numbers of people who develop immune response happens around day 28. So what therefore could happen in between, and if I heard your question well, is that you know, the individual had received a vaccine you know, in, in, two, in the previous two weeks and within seven days developed flu. Now, the other issue as well would be when the flu developed, do we know what the medical issues were? What was it? Did that individual test positive again for COVID-19 or not? Because like I say, he probably got exposed before his body had mounted a good enough immune response. And so, you know, anything could have happened. Now, what, when we talk about vaccination, what we say and from the data that we have seen is that it really it protects individuals from severe disease and death in that if you're looking at the percentage of efficacy is much higher for that and it, for instance the the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is sitting at around 85 87 percent for severe disease and death whereas for mild disease we are sitting around 65%. Now what that means, that's why we continue to say, even when you have been vaccinated, you're gonna need to actually continue 
wearing your mask and social distancing because you can still be infected, but it's not going to result in severe diseases. It's unlikely to result in severe disease. And if you can still be infected, it therefore means you can still transmit to the next person. So I think these are some of the issues that we're going to need to continue uh, educating you know, the, 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 the communities so they get a better understanding of where the problems are. Now, the other question about, um, I think the other question also was talking about African, um, no, 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 misinformation first. So, um, there has been a lot of that, there has been a lot of conspiracies, and I think what's going to be important, and I keep saying this, it's important for us to make sure, when I say us, I mean anybody who has got the opportunity and who knows, um, uh, uh, who has got knowledge. And whether you are in the private sector or public sector within health or your government for that matter, we need to make sure that we hold ourselves accountable to educating the public, to actually explaining, like I was doing here, what it means, so that people can get a better understanding and for people to be able to ask questions and then we direct them as to where the reliable sources of information are. So really for me, I think when it comes to misinformation, the best is going to be for us to continue educating. The same thing that we saw with HIV, there was a lot of advocacy, there was a lot of information that was in every billboard about HIV. We really need to get to that so that people get a better understanding and then they are able to make um, informed decisions. Then the question about um, history repeating itself and you know, African knowledge, I guess, you know, that's where I'm going to be um, challenged again. But for me, the only piece I would really say is that when we talk as Africans and we say we need to actually claim re our respect back, I'm always the first person to say we need to first respect ourselves. We need to first appreciate each other. We need to, as an African you know, nation, to actually uh, there was, there's a book, I think it was a Prof. Mohale's a book that says, lift as you rise. We need to get to that point where we actually appreciate each other and we are people who pull each other up as we rise so that then other nations will be able to respect us as well. We need to be people who actually know how to work things out, how to actually find solutions for ourselves so that we can be taken seriously. So really, I'm, I'm throwing this back at us to say, how do we make sure that we show respect? I mean, yeah, I actually don't want to get a, you know, a lot into this because there is just so much that we need to change as a nation, that we need to change amongst ourselves. Whether we're talking gender-based violence, we're talking you know, how we are able to actually support each other as families. So really for me, I would say, let's bring this back to ourselves and build each other up. And once we start building each other up and actually forming units where we can actually trust one another. I, I usually say, if you're looking at all other nations, they are able to actually team up together and do things together. But you never see that amongst us. And we really need to deal with that and see how do we build each other up so that we can form these strong you know, uh, 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 bonds with each other. Whether it's at business level. Right now, the first you know, things that we will do it's okay for us to go and buy from any other, you know, shops, but not the Afri you know, a shop that is owned by somebody that you know. And that's where we need to start, where we support African business, where we support black business. You know, where, you know, we are able to go, if somebody next door is selling, you know, uh, uh, vegetables, that's where I must go and buy, rather than going and buying from somebody else that I don't even know who they are. And as we do that, I believe we then can really form a much stronger bonds and we then will be appreciated and will be respected. What is government stand on, on Sputnik vaccines? As I have said, there's a wide range of vaccines that are available and Sputnik is one of those. And in fact, at the moment, the, 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 the regulatory body is currently reviewing applications from, you know, from, 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 from the 
from the Russian government you know, for, for, for the Sputnik, Sputnik vaccine. So it is in process, it is being evaluated. Remember, every vaccine that comes into the country has got to go through the, you know, the regulatory body for them to assess and make sure that all the documents are correct and then once that vaccine gets, gets you know into the country it then gets evaluated to ensure that it is actually doing what it is supposed to do and before it can be actually approved by SAPRA. So at the moment there are you know Sputnik I know is one of those that is being currently uh, evaluated. Thanks I think I've covered everything. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Um, we are now going into the last round of questions. If they, <laughs> if they could be less than five, um, so that we should rush towards um, closing. I learned there's a question or two from other platforms. I'll request you to read them loud um, so that um, we could um, respond to them. But first, let me have are there any of you who still wanted to ask questions from the ground? It will only be one and the two that comes from other platforms. Um, thank you. Can we start with other platforms if there are any questions? Okay, these are questions that are coming from the YouTube platform. And we have a question from Ronnie Bina. And it says, it is still going to be tough for South Africans. The privatization conundrum and the paradox of the South African economy. It will be the survival of the fittest. Um, the second one is from Soli Makoela. He says, what role do universities or institutions of higher learning do to help in the addressing of poverty in the country? And finally, we have a question from Nkadema Kinika. Um, she says, I am currently in Nigeria. There is no mask, no COVID. My question is why are the developed why is a developed country like South Africa uh, why do they have problems? Okay. Thank you. Um, from the floor. My question is, we know that, uh, or we heard that the disease originated in China. Um, then one year, three months down the line, South Africa has got a very high number of um, infections and deaths. But I, I, don't, I might be uh, ignorant, but I don't hear much about China. What is China doing right that we in South Africa are not doing? And also, the last question from the, the, the social media was going to be my second question that why is South Africa as compared to the rest of Africa? deteriorating in, 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 in handling this uh, disease. We don't hear reports from the African uh, countries. Uh, but my last uh, question would be, I got vaccinated amongst the first of the elders over 60. And uh, we were given three weeks to come back now, what was happening between the three weeks that when we have to go back, I was supposed to go back on, on Tuesday, then uh, I was informed not to come. What was happening that they gave us three weeks and then changed? Now I'm waiting for the new data. I still need to understand, was there still research happening on how effective the Pfizer um, um, vaccine, uh, vaccine works or what is really happening? Nobody informed us what is happening. Okay. Thank you. 
No, thanks. Um, uh, the final one, Prof, is um, if you could comment on giving health and economics their rightful position without any beating the other into submission. That is coexistence of the two. Thank you. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, my core uh, speaker had to leave early, and I, I will skip the the private sector, you know, economy questions, you know, in case I embarrass myself. Um, COVID, why in South Africa? Um, firstly, COVID is not only in South Africa, but actually it is, as I have shown you, across the globe. Um, yes, we have got the highest numbers, and um, the if you recall how it came through, is that firstly, as South Africa, we are the sort of port of entry for most countries. And you would have seen that uh, when we started, um, it was mainly from travelers. That's how it got to, into the country. It was mainly from travelers. We saw it in Cape Town, around Joburg. The, 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 the challenge that we had is that we then were not able to prevent it from getting established amongst communities. And when it then settled in the you know, um, crowded communities of the country, we found ourselves with community transmission. And we really have not managed to clear that. And so that is why the minute, just like what we saw in India, in that in India they had the first wave which was not that much and they really thought they had conquered it and they sort of relaxed and went back to sort of like life before COVID and before they knew it then they were hit with the worst case scenario that we have just recently seen. So the, 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 ch the, the challenge is what is it that we do when the transmission seems to be low, the minute we start to relax and we go back to big gatherings and we go back to, you know, uh, forgetting about uh, 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 social distancing, that's when then, you know, you can find this wave starting all over again. And that really for me is the challenge that we're facing in the country. So that, and I really don't want us to, to, to say, to then therefore compare ourselves. For instance, somebody was making an example like, you know, in, in Nigeria, they're not seeing COVID. It might be, I, 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 I am not very clear. It might be it's because they did not have the level of community transmission that, they ha that we are having. But for us as a country, we need to understand that we can see the numbers. I mean, we saw the numbers coming right down and we now can see the numbers rising. And as somebody earlier on was talking about fatigue in that when people get to relax and forget and don't do what they're supposed to do that's when we see the numbers rising and so really for me is be to challenge us back and say well as a country, this is what we're facing right now, and we've got a responsibility to protect ourselves as individuals and protect those around us. What is it that China may have done right? <coughs> It may be the fact that, I mean, people have actually been saying if you go to China, they, you know, the, the use, use of masks has been the norm for quite a while. And so when they then went into lockdown and they were able to contain and control, you know, the transmissions. And probably the other challenge as well is that for as long as we are not maintaining the transmission and also as we are allowing waves to come, those waves tend to then delay even the vaccination that we really are so behind, which we should be catching up on as a country. And so you find that when then they were able to actually um, um, uh, minimize the transmission in China, then they were able to 
kickstart with vaccination. And what we are seeing now, the data that is coming out, is as more and more countries are increasing the numbers that are getting vaccinated, they are definitely seeing the infections coming down, and they have actually been, they've maintained that for quite a while. So we're beginning to see the effects of, of vaccination, that if you vaccinate up to a certain level, it definitely does reduce community transmission that is happening. So we need to actually reach, unfortunately as a country, we are far from being there, and that's why we need to still be cautious and be uh, 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 and, and actually look at this very closely. So remember, we keep saying this because this is a new disease, and even the vaccines are new. So we continue to look for data, and actually, as more data comes up, we then are able to change whatever policies that were there. And the, 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 the interval between doses is actually a classical example of that. Like I was saying before, the, for vaccines that are two doses, if you're looking at the trials that were done, this, they space those doses either 21 or 28 days. That's when they would give the second dose. So as more data is coming up now, and they could see, you know, you know, there was a stage where countries were desperate to get as many people vaccinated, at least to get the first dose. And this, and also there were people who would not come on the expected date, like day 21, for example. So people would, you know, they would lapse a few days, a week there or two weeks there. And because they were collecting the data, they were actually able to see that you can actually push the second dose up to 42 days with people building and mounting an immune response. So that's why, especially because we seem to be struggling to get doses into the country. So it makes sense then for government to say, get as many people to receive at least the first dose because there's data that shows you can push it up to 42 days. Let's push the second dose to 42 days. And that's what we have uh, actually advised government to do. And obviously as more data comes, we'll be able to come back and say, okay, and also if access to vaccines was not a challenge, we would have probably, you know, left it at three, three weeks, but because we realize that access is a challenge, then let's gain and make sure more people are getting at least their single dose, their first dose, and then at 42 days, they will get the second dose, and hopefully by then, there will be better and more access to other uh, vaccine products. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof, for taking the bigger load of the questions and handling them very well. I think my responsibilities are done. Let me hand back to you, uh, Master of Ceremonies. I thank you all. Um, thank you, Dr. Debeta, for that process. Unfortunately, Dr. Mohal Hale had to rush um, to those of you who have posed questions to him, kindly con uh, look at your, your social media. Um, he will respond via the social media to your responses uh, based on, on your questions. So, Liska Khatalang, he will respond to your questions. We will filter them through to him and he will respond back to you uh, timelessly. At this point in time, because we need to release Mama and she's rushing off also, please, if you can come up. And now, Mama, if you can come up. Uh, this is the last part of uh, our program before we hand over for a vote of thanks. Can we have a rov can we have a roving mic, please? Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, before we close off, I'll hand over to uh, Ma'am um, Anna Malay on behalf of the management of the school. 
uh, for a vote of thanks. Can we give a round of applause, please? Uh, good afternoon, program director and ladies and gentlemen, and the few young people that we have amongst us. I take this great opportunity to thank all of you for being present, despite the cold weather and everything else, and COVID-19 as well. I want to say, on behalf of the principal, unfortunately, he was he is unable to be here. We have lost a learner, uh, a grade 12 learner, and the funeral happens to be today, so he is unable to be here. However, I would like to say that those, uh, a professor and the gentleman that was also talking about the economics, I want to say it was really a wonderful you know, experience to have you present here and to be able to hear directly from you as to what is happening. I feel very empowered and uh, a lot of the questions that have been, you know, answers that I've been looking for, you know, have been answered here. And a very big thank you also, I think my learners have done exceptionally well. A great thank you to you. And a real big thank you to our alumni, you've never failed us. I've been at Morris for a long period of time and I want to say you have been doing a splendid job. You have chosen the best themes every single year that I've been here. It is a, a great opportunity every single year when I attend. It is something that I go back with, that I cherish and appreciate and admire. What, have you, what you guys have done for Morris Isaacson, and your lectures have been very, very splendid, uh, great uh, you know, uh, information sharing, and it has always been a real wonderful experience for me as a person that has not gone through as many of the challenges that you guys have gone through in Soweto. However, for the many years that I've been here, from 2007, I've learned, I've grown, I've shared, I've felt I'm empathizing and sympathizing, and everything that you actually mention is so part of me, and I'm so grateful for that opportunity. And I thank you all very much. Please keep safe, let us follow the protocols, and do what we have to do to keep our communities, our families, and our friends, and everybody that we come into contact with safe. A safe journey to you, and I've had a splendid time today. Thank you so much. A final word from me, and on behalf of the Morris Isaacson alumni, uh, we thank you very, very much, and we hope that um, when you get home, you will share the little bit of information that you received today, not only with your families, but spread it around with, with everyone else. Now, uh, we have a saving station outside uh, for some a little bit of lunch that has been prepared for us. Uh, but with COVID regulations, we are going to split up um, uh, the professor and, and some of the members of, of the alumni will be taken up to the main administration block and then the other members will remain down here to be served here with the, uh, the, the, the TV camera crew guys will be served down here. And also, thank you, thank you, thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause, please. Even those that are watching virtually. Thank you, thank you, and God bless you. Safe travels. Good night.